So it's been really exciting to be an astrobiologist nowadays because astrobiology is starting to intersect a lot of other fields that care very deeply about understanding life um, from the perspective of thinking about more general principles. And one of those fields is the artificial life field, which has been um, exploring fundamental properties of life and evolving systems um, for a number of decades and has made a lot of progress in computational models of living processes that are starting to be able to be used for thinking about problems relevant to astrobiology. Um, and so I'm going to just talk about a little bit of a where artificial life comes into providing some new insights into what biology might be um, and how we might think about life um, as a broader class of phenomena from this astrobiological perspective that we want to understand life, not just on Earth, but life as it might exist anywhere. Um, and one of the things that I always find really intriguing um, being trained in physics is that biology um, seems to necessitate um, a different kind of perspective on how we should think about the laws of nature, how we should think about um, uh, dynamical systems. Um, and one of the, the things that's really a, a pretty interesting contrast between physics and biology is that in physics, when we model systems, we always talk about like the initial state, like you could talk initial state of the universe or initial state of the solar system, and then you have some fixed law of motion um, like Newton's law of gravitation, or we could take Einstein's theory, and then we can evolve our system forward in time and we can predict the final state. And um, in principle, we should be able to do that with um, uh, perfect prediction power if we had you know, big enough supercomputers and things. Um, but there's, there's nothing about the laws of motion um, that changes in time, so Newton's law doesn't change, it's just the states that evolve forward in time. But in biology, we have this really interesting um, case where we have an initial state, like say the last universal common ancestor of life on Earth, and then as that system evolves, it changes, and there's many possible final states. So even though we started from sort of a, a, a shared um, cellular architecture in early history of life, um, because of the interaction of life and its environment and the change of information in those systems, we've ended up with many, many different final states for biology in some sense. So I am an organism that descended from that last universal common ancestor, and so is a bacteria you know, on, on the screen, the computer screen that I'm looking at right now. Um, and so, um, so there's many po final states possible in biology. And one of the ways that we can talk about this is to even talk about the fact that in biology, this, the states themselves um, are not the only thing that's evolving, but the laws are too. Um, and we talk about state-dependent rules or state-dependent laws in biology. And this is the idea that as an organism evolves, its genetic information is changing. Um, and even as it um, expresses that genetic information, um, it can actually dictate um, its own state. So biology has this property of homeostasis and regulating its own state. That's sort of a, a state control. And this kind of like the rules are actually controlling the state or, or the constraints are controlling the state. So that seems really fundamentally different than the situation that we see in physics and how we model physical systems that aren't living. Um, and the real story there is that in biology, um, part of the dynamics is the information and how the information is changing in time. Um, and so in the artificial life field, people like to try to model these um, emergent properties or, or what's going on in biology um, using really simple systems that allow us to understand really basic things about life. Um, and so one example that is used commonly in artificial life field is the um, cellular automata. Um, and one of the reasons that people really like those is because they have really simple local rules, just like the laws of physics do, but we see really um, interesting global patterns emerging. Um, and so for example, this is an elementary cellular automata, rule 150, um, and you can see here what the pattern is for the rule. So if you have three white cells, it maps to a white cell. If you have three black cells, it maps to a black cell. And then different patterns of whites and black cells will either map to a black or white cell. So it's a very simple rule, but you'll see that there's this really regular pattern that emerges when you run the dynamics um, that's not encoded in the rule at all. So we talk about that as an emergent property. And life has many emergent properties. And so one question is, um, would those emergent properties of life be explained by the structure of the laws of physics alone, or do we need additional principles, and do we really need something like state dependent dynamics or information or any new principles that are uniquely biological to explain how biology has this sort of many paths um, that we observe through the evolutionary process?
And that's a great question for artificial life. People have thought about that from many different perspectives in addition to cellular automata. But we'll talk about cellular automata just a little bit more because they're a really nice, simple example. Um, and so, as I said, this is an example of this idea in physics of starting with an initial state, a fixed law of motion, and evolving to some final state. The game of life is perhaps one of the most famous examples of using this kind of um, construction to understand what emergent properties are and how complexity can emerge from simple rules. So in the game of life, it's actually a two-dimensional cellular automata as opposed to the one-dimensional one I showed on the previous slide. Um, and what you see is with the game of life, all kinds of emergent patterns appearing um, from things that glide across your screen that look like um, little gun shooting things um, to blinkers um, to all kinds of different structures and they can interact and make more complex structures. And so people have actually, um, there's sort of a cottage industry of people studying different emergent patterns in the game of life and under what conditions they emerge, um, what their computational capacity is. Um, and so it's been a really great uh, toy model system to explore this idea that emergence might emerge, we might be able to talk about emergent properties from simple rules. Um, one of my favorite cellular automata is actually um, constructed by John von Neumann, and he was really interested in this idea of self-reproducing machines. And so a self-reproducing um, machine or automata would be a system that can make a complete reproduction of itself. And he was actually really inspired um, by Alan Turing and Turing's work on universal computation. So Turing had been interested in whether you could build um, a machine that could compute any computable function. And von Neumann asked the question, inspired by trying to understand life. So this is very early work in the artificial life field. Could you build a machine that could build any possible machine, including itself? And if it could do that, then it would be a self-reproducing machine, but it would also be a machine that could, in principle, be capable of open-ended evolution, which is a really important question in the artificial life field related to astrobiology, um, about the idea of whether or not evolving systems can keep evolving forever. So if you had a self-reproducing machine that could build itself but not build any arbitrary machine, it might stall out and not actually be an evolving system. And so von Neumann had this condition that it should be able to build anything so that the space of all possible things would be completely open, um, that it could potentially evolve into it as long as it could maintain the fact that it could reproduce itself. And so he came up with a particular architecture that's necessary for such a machine. Um, and um, what he uh, basically came up with is that you need to have some kind of information content, the instructions for specifying the design of the machine. The machine has to be able to read out those instructions to build itself and then it has to be able to have something called a supervisory unit that tells it when to copy the instructions just as instructions rather than reading them out. So the instructions have to have a dual role. They have to be able to be copied um, to be able to reproduce the organism but they also have to be read out to be able to be executed to construct the organism. And the machine doing the construction is the part that can, is the machine that can build any possible machine. And he called that a universal constructor. And there is a direct analogy with modern cellular architecture as we understand it, in that the translation machinery, ribosomes, um, and all the associated um, tRNAs um, and um, translation machinery um, could be thought of as a universal constructor that can construct any possible protein. So it's not a universal constructor in the sense that it can make any possible object, um, but it is a universal constructor in the sense that it can produce any possible protein. And the instruction tape is DNA, uh, which gets read out by the cell, um, but also gets blindly copied by the cell at other stages um, in cellular function. And so it does seem to be the case that this abstract idea from artificial life, von Neumann's idea of the self-reproducing automata, actually maps to some of the function that we see in biology. And so this was a case where a cellular automata um, theory actually predicted some of the logical architecture of um, modern organisms. Um, and so one of the things that's really interesting about von Neumann's idea was that he had envisioned the possibility of a machine that could build any possible machine, um, which means it could do any possible transformation on physical matter. 
Um, and most cellular automata actually can't do that. So if you look at cellular automata and you evolve them forward in time um, in the way that we do, where we have an initial condition and the cellular automata rule is fixed for all time, not every state transformation is possible. So you can't move from every state to every other state. Um, but there is this idea um, that's implicit in von Neumann's theory for um, biological evolution um, from this artificial life perspective of physical universality, which is the ability to implement any transformation on any finite region. Um, and uh, the first physical universal cellular automata was actually just realized recently um, by Luke Schaefer. Um, and, um, uh, and he actually demonstrated it was possible to construct such a thing. And he did so within this sort of traditional physics paradigm um, where he started with an initial state and evolved the system um, according to a fixed rule, and the physical universality comes about by programming the initial state. Um, now, if we're thinking about things like biological evolution, and we want to think about biological systems in this kind of very abstract way, inspired by artificial life, um, and think about von Neumann's um, theory and what it's really telling us about biology, one of the things we might hope for is that biology would actually be capable of performing um, any arbitrary transformation. And a good example of that is modern technology. So I think actually modern technology is a better approximation to a universal constructor than an interior of a cell in the sense that technology enables lots of transformations to be possible. Um, so for example, we can launch satellites into space um, and, um, and that's not a transformation that would be able to be happening. We wouldn't be, our planet wouldn't be um, anti-accreting launching things into planetary orbit without having technology. So, um, so it does allow transformations, and biology seems to do this in general. If you think about metabolism, allows chemical transformations that seem thermodynamically impossible. Um, so if you wanted to talk about um, those kind of properties from this um, cellular automata perspective, what you really would like is to be able to build a cellular automata that can perform any arbitrary transformation and has this kind of inspiration from biology. Um, so we've been kind of playing around with those in my group, and this is sort of an example of a, um, an artificial life approach to astrobiology. Um, thinking about cellular automata with state-dependent laws, so the idea here is that we go back to that difference that we were observing between physics and biology and think about the fact that life um, seems to have this property where the rules and the states are very tightly coupled, so my, the expression of my genetic information determines the, cells, the state of the cells in my body. My mental state determines something about what I do. Um, and so, um, so if you want to build systems that do that, you can actually build cellular automata state-dependent laws, and you see lots of different rich structures emerging from these kind of systems. And they do have this property of physical universality that Schaefer observed, but from this very different perspective. And so these are just some examples to raise some questions for you about the kinds of things that we could be thinking about from more abstract models of life from the artificial life field to get at more general principles of living systems. So we have this idea in mind that information perhaps might be this unifying principle of life. And that really also comes from the inspiration of the artificial life field because von Neumann was really interested in this idea of um, the instruction the information content being what's specifying the design of the machine and that the machine could actually implement those instructions. And so in some sense, um, what he's talking about is an algorithmic process existing in nature is necessary to have open-ended evolving systems. And so we really don't understand the basic physical principles of that. And so one of the things I think is incredibly exciting about working across the field of artificial life and astrobiology is that artificial life models have traditionally been these very abstract cellular automata type models, or there's other things like Avita, um, that are these digital systems that we program into computers and we study their properties and they tell us some things about emergent properties or how systems can evolve. But astrobiology affords the opportunity of starting to think about those kind of things as chemically embodied systems and how do we think about the fact that the origin of life transition actually did happen, these properties emerged in the natural world from chemistry. Um, and so that's really the challenge for astrobiology moving ahead is to take the abstract ideas from artificial life and turn them into quantitative science for astrobiology to build new theories of what we think life is and how the transition from simple molecules to something that has the sophisticated logical and informational architecture of something like a von Neumann machine actually emerged on our planet.
and what does that actually mean in the broadest sense and, and what are the kind of classes of phenomena that we might see in the world that could be inspired by that understanding, i.e. can we find aliens? Um, and so that's really a great thing to think about.